Okay, I have six thirty. Excuse me, we're going to begin the meeting. So I'd like to call the order special meeting number 1840 of the Planning Zoning Commission. We are attending tonight at Scout Hall located at 28 Abbey Road, East Windsor, as well as on the Zoom platform. We have a quorum that we have four regular members present tonight. So for those who have not attended one of these meetings before, uh, tonight's meeting is composed of two parts, a public hearing and a public meeting. During the public hearing, the first thing we will do is read the public notice into the record. Then we will list the a list and briefly describe the documents received in the file. The applicant will then present the application to us in detail, which will allow the commission members and the public the opportunity to better understand what is proposed. The commission members may, be at, may ask questions during the presentation. Then we will ask members of the public who support the application to speak. And then we will ask for those who oppose the application to come forward. And lastly, we will let those who do not wish to be classified as either in support or op opposition to come forward. One thing we do ask if you come forward to speak, there is a sign up sheet at the podium. Please list your name for the record on the, on the sheet as well as state your name for the record. If you wish to speak, please raise your hand and wait to be recognized by the chair. Unmute the microphone or come forward to the podium and identify yourself by name and speak into the microphone and address all comments directly to the chair and not to the applicant or other members of the public. Be advised that this is your opportunity to ask questions and make comments on the application because once the hearing is closed, no additional testimony from the public or the applicant may be permitted. After everyone has a full opportunity to speak, all questions have been answered and all information has been received. We will decide whether it is appropriate to close the hearing. We will not consider voting on the application until the public meeting. The second part of the, pub, of the meeting is the public meeting. We will deliberate on the application submitted to us and decide how to act on them. The commission may approve the application as submitted, approve it with stipulations, conditions, and or modifications, table actions to a future meeting, or in rare cases, deny the application. Three affirmative votes from the commission are, are generally required to approve any application. If you have to leave the meeting before the decision is rendered, you may call the planning and development office tomorrow afternoon or and to get the results of tonight's meeting or it is also gonna be posted on the town's website uh, under the planning and zoning commission. Okay, so there was a legal notice. The East Windsor, East Windsor Planning and Zoning Commission will hold the following public hearing on Tuesday, December 13th, 2022 at 6.30. Details regarding how to attend will be published on the commission's agenda and will be made available on the town's website. PZ 2022-22. The applicant is the East Windsor Historical Society, 115 Scandic Road, is requesting a special use permit for event hosting Map 064, Block 32, Lot 028A, Zone B1, A1, and A2. A full copy of the application is available on the Planning and Zoning Commission's website, of the town's website. All interested persons may attend this meeting and provide verbal or written comments regarding this application. And this was posted in the Journal Inquirer on December 2nd, 2022, and December 9th, 2022. This portion is our public participation part of the meeting. This gives anybody the opportunity to speak on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on a topic that is not on tonight's agenda? Okay, hearing none, is there anybody online on Zoom that wishes to speak on something that is not on tonight's agenda? Okay, I will take that as a no. Next item is approval of minutes. 
<laughs> we have the meeting minutes of November 22nd, 22, regular meeting uh, 1839. Does anybody on the commission have any changes, additions, modifications? No, all good. No. Okay, I also find them in order. So I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of regular meeting 1839 held November 22nd, 2022 as presented. Okay, there's a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dave. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, so we'll move right on into the new public hearing, PZ 2022-26, uh, 115 Scanic Road, a special use permit for event hosting. The applicant is East Windsor Historical Society, who is here to speak on behalf of the applicant. Uh, for the record, my name is Jay Ursery. Uh, I'm a land surveyor and principal of the firm of J.R. Russell and Associates here in East Windsor. And we prepared the plans that are here in support of this special use permit application for the East Windsor Historical Society. Uh, we're also here with me this evening is Scott Heskett from F.A. Heskett and Associates. He's got a traffic engineer who's going to be talking to you a little bit about a traffic impact report that he put together. Uh, our architect, Lori Batista, is also here. She'll be talking to you a little bit about the building that we plan on renovating. Uh, she's got some memories here to show you what that's going to look like, a floor plan, and so forth that we want to share with you. Uh, I'm going to go through the site plan with you and some of the approval uh, criteria that we're seeing in the regular <clears throat> terms of what you need to be thinking about uh, with the approval of a special use permit. But before we even get into that, um, I guess well, one more thing our attorney, Carly and the lady, was not able to be here tonight. We had a meeting conflict, um, which was not going to be able to be here, although we certainly be meeting with him tomorrow. So Talk about what happened this evening and what we plan on having in the future. More or less, as soon as the district is held, we'll be continuing and we'll be meeting again. So, before we go any further, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the regulation and how we're here and how we got here. We really had an informal discussion about that a number of months ago with the commission and with the town staff. And, and we initially took this project on, this, at least in my eyes, looking through the regs, trying to figure out how we can fit it. So it's been like it's going to work. And it was a little confusing for me. And so I looked at the farm regulations, which are relatively new to the town of East Windsor, but that's where the avenue is that allows us to come to you to apply for this special use permit. And there's a number of things in the farm regulations, but I think it's important to know right in the very beginning of the regulation. And this is section 305. 305.1 talks about the purpose of the farm regulation. And it says the section is to promote the preservation of agricultural land and support agriculture as an important and viable business and lifestyle in the town of East Windsor while preserving the public health, safety, and welfare. And it goes on to talk a little bit about animals and caretakers and agricultural practices and proper housing and pasture and waste management and those types of things. And then it goes into a number of <clears throat> different paragraphs and sections about different types of livestock and kind of animals you can have for each of these types of things. But when we flip through a number of the pages and we get towards the rear, of this particular section of 305, we get to a, a section that talks about other related uses, which is 305.7. And in that section, 305.7b, it says uses requiring a special use permit. And 
it talks about a number of things that would be allowed with this permit, including field workers' housing, which you had an application just recently for that before you uh, came under this same special use permit regulation. A uh, commercial riding or facility, bed and breakfast facility could be applied for farm stores. And number five, our application, event hosting such as banquet and rental facilities. It also allows commercial recreation and retail sales of propane, kennels, veterinary clinic shelters, fur farms, and slaughterhouses, uh, sawmills, and wineries and breweries would be allowed by a special use permit under this regulation. So that's how we apply, and, and that's what the the application uh, is about. It's a special use permit to allow event hosting uh, on this particular property. This is by the historical society. So with that said, I'm going to give you a, an overview of the actual site plan. Unfortunately, it's a little more difficult here because we don't have our white but I'll do my best in trying to start you off with, with an overall area of view of the property. And I apologize if I know I'm probably standing in front of some people blocking them. And uh, it's a little difficult, but this is uh, basically a shot of the town's GIS in Louisville that shows the society's parcel as well as parcels that surround it. And if we take a look at this, Cemetery Road is located here, Scanic Road is located up here, and the parcel is roughly 42 acres in size and goes all the way back to the Scenic River, which is located a little bit here to the east. Agricultural land is located up here on the upper land when we get down towards the river and drops down at elevation. Gets into some wetlands and into an area of a conservation easement in favor of the, the USA. It was, I think, the USDA actually that took the easement on the property with the economy. The building that we're talking about has been called the Blue Barn. The Blue Barn is located right here. And that's really the subject of the application. There are other buildings on the property, there are other agricultural buildings here. The academy is here. Uh, the historic house recently renovated here. And I guess the barbershop. And it's a cool house. I mean, the other buildings that have been renovated. The school, Barber Hill School, is located there. So we're going to be talking about the blue barn and the use that we would like to propose for the blue barn in this particular application. This is just an overall to kind of show that we've got farms to the north, historical properties here, one, two, three residences here, third residence here, and the cemetery located further to the east, uh, adjacent to the Schultz property. And the, Another property owned by the society. So let's put this down for a minute. So now we're going to focus in at a shot basically on the blue bar. So, so we're at different scale and we're really focused in right on this particular area of the site. <clears throat> so now we're looking at Cemetery Road on this side, Scenic Road here, okay, Historic House, Academy, um, Barber Hill School, Barbershop, Probate Court, Barn, Blue Barn is subject to the renovation. Other agricultural buildings located here, and there's the property off here to the east towards uh, the Scenic River. So, in this particular instance, the barn is what we would be renovating. Lori from PPT is going to talk to you a little more about that. Uh, the barn located here, entrance to the property, ingress and egress 
off the cemetery road coming in this location, parking, 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 handicap parking located over here. There will be an emergency access that comes out that will allow access back out to Skiatic Road for emergency vehicles, but would not be used by patrons of this facility strictly for emergency vehicles. So everybody will be coming in and out over here uh, on Cemetery Road. In terms of a uh, sanitary facility, we have sewer here. Uh, the sanitary sewer is located out here in Scanic Road. Uh, we did submit an application to WPCA. It's been a number of months, probably springtime, I think. And that was approved. Uh, there is a copy of that approval that was with the application, and you should have that in your packets. Uh, obviously, we had water available from the well that's here that they've been using. We have obviously electric that will be available to come into the site to power everything we need to power. There will also be a generator located at this site if it's approved. And a sanitary pump station to pump our sewage from here back up and into the road. In terms of, of parking, um, the parking regulations for this type of a use uh, is based on the number of, of patrons or occupancy. And there's, we're looking at 250 in terms of maximum occupancy, and it's uh, one for three, which would require us so to get 82, 83 spaces, and we're providing 88 spaces, and including uh, three uh, ADA spaces. And Scott's going to talk a little bit more about that when he gets into the traffic in terms of volumes and levels of service and that type of thing. In terms of storm drainage, Right now, this site essentially is closed from the west on the Scenic Roadside towards the east. All the water from this site heads in this direction. There's a little farm pond that's located here on the Schultz property. There's a pipe under the road. It continues on, gets into the brook that goes down through the cemetery and eventually uh, discharges into uh, the Scenic River. So, we provided a drainage system on the site. The stormwater management basin is located here. And we provided obviously been drainage calculations to, to your staff, uh, the town engineer. Town engineer has reviewed that. Uh, it provides zero increase in runoff for all the required storm events and providers the required treatment. And I think, again, you have a memo with your packets that speaks to the review by Glenn Norton, your town engineer, with this review of, of the site and of the drainage itself. <clears throat> so that's a, a basic overview of, of what was proposing here. And I think at this point, um, I'm going to head back over the podium here. I've got some other things that I want to talk about. So, one of the things that we look at when we're talking about special use permits and, and there's some considerations that the Commission has to look at, and this has been uh, chapter 7, section 701, and there's some things that the commission needs to consider, like public health, safety, general welfare, those types of things. And then there's some, some things that we need to consider as the applicant in, in, in terms of the plan of conservation and development. Does this proposal uh, agree with the the POC data. So what I've done here is just to bear with you for a minute. I'm going to give you all a copy of a section of the POC data. I've got some information highlighted for you. Thank 
Did you shut that like, off? Yeah. Oh. Didn't like, it didn't like that. Thank you, sir. So when we look at the POC data, which is this quick holder, and when we go to the table of contents, and you can see that I've highlighted some things here in chapter two, uh, it talks about conserving community resources, preserve open space, protect environmental quality, preserve community assets, cultural and history, and agricultural assets in the community. And, and I think in general, when we talk about the historical society here in Windsor, this is something that they've been doing for decades here. Um, they're trying to preserve the historical items from East Windsor, whether it's buildings or whatever it may be. You know, everybody that here is from Windsor to the museum. Um, I have, it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of things to look at in there. And, and you could spend many hours in there with some of the information that they have. And, and some of it even relates to what we do as surveyors on a regular basis. We have historical mapping, things that you might not find somewhere else that might give us some information about what was going on in some of the villages in East Windsor back in the 1800s. What happened? And sometimes it's, it gives us a name, maybe, of a property owner that. Might give us some information and help us put a boundary together. You know, in one instance, we were, we were working on something over on the top of Carrie's Fall Road. There was some information we, we found there that was helpful. We got a name, you know, we got some old railroad mapping, which helped us determine who the ownership was and how the property was divided up. So <clears throat> the folks at the society, their members, their board of directors. This is something that, that they've been doing here in town for a long, long time in terms of things that are talked about here in your POC data. So if we look a little further, and, and I jumped around into a bit of to be honest. Uh, page 40 talks about primary strategy <clears throat> defining the village area development. And it talks about all the, the villages of East Windsor. And certainly we all know about Broadbrook, and we know about Warehouse Point. Um, but there's also Melrose. And some people probably don't know where Melrose is, and it's really not pertinent to this application, but it's another village, had its own post office at one time. Uh, Windsorville, same thing, another village, had its own post office. At one time, actually, not that long ago, I didn't remember that. And we have Scanner. So we're in the village of Scanner. And here it talks about you know, preserving the village. And if we go down to number three, it talks about for Scanner, Windsorville, and Melrose, develop village plans for each of these areas to establish architectural guidelines, lot requirements, densities. Serve the historic character. Well, we like to think we're doing preserve the rural agricultural character. We're doing that and <clears throat> enhance the architectural character respectively. I think when you see some of the renderings that our architect has put together for this current metal skin building. I think you would all agree that we're enhancing the architectural and agricultural character in the area. If we flip over to page 41 and go to item five, it says, in scanning, enhance and protect historic resources, the character of the land in the vicinity and the 
distribution of it was to be solicited. Again, we believe we're doing that. We are protecting the historic resources. That's really the mission, or one of the missions of the historical society is to preserve some of the historical resources and we lose them and bring them to this location so that we can't preserve them. And that's what they've been doing for decades. The last page that I've highlighted here for you, there's a, there's a conceptual Scantic Village District map and it's in the upper right hand corner on page 43. And the area that we're talking about right here, if you look in the middle of it, intersection of Cemetery Road and Scantic Road, you see a little B1 zone, this is the business zone, which is mostly our neighbors houses to the west of us, and then the A1 zone, which is most of the property uh, that's within the actual historical society lands. And then if we flip over to chapter five, conclusions, overall vision for East Wind, this future generally remain the same from year to year, and they are the rural village agriculture and big business character of the defining schools that must be preserved to keep the town an attractive place to live and play. Residential and village area development must be carefully guided to ensure compatibility with community character and allow these things to prepare for the impacts of future growth. So that's something that you as the commission has to think about in terms of this application and you know, are we needing some of the guidelines to go CD? We certainly think we are. And we're preserving some agriculture, but we're certainly preserving some historic nature of this concern. And, and we believe that we are certainly needing some of the goals here in the POCD. So that said, the next thing that we need to talk about a little bit is the special permit itself I mean, within your regulations. Um, again, chapter seven, where we get into special permits and the first thing it says is in accordance with the plan of conservation and development. We just talked about it. And, and we believe that certainly we are meeting some of these goals within your PMCD. But then it talks about a number of other things. And it talks about the 701 to harmony with the area. And yeah, certainly in trying to keep the majority of this lane in the agricultural use and allowing some, what I'm going to say is probably going to be limited assembly use of this particular building. We feel that that's going to help us preserve the agricultural nature of, the, of most of this property here that the society owns. It talks about access, adequate access. Scott Eskitz would talk about that when we get into the traffic <clears throat> study. Talk about infrastructure. And we have sewer, we have water, we have electric. We don't have natural gas, we'd like to have it. We'll be using propane. So we believe we certainly have adequate infrastructure for this facility. It talks about natural resource conservation and conservation of natural features, drainage basins, protecting the environment, the area. We certainly feel that we're, we're doing that here. There's, this is an existing building, it's a new building. Um, the drainage doesn't change a whole lot. We certainly would want to preserve all of the area of the building to the east. Talks about compatible design, being attractive, suitable in relation to the characters and style of other buildings in the area. We currently have a metal skin built. Probably more akin to a, an industrial pipe building, you know, it's used for agriculture. 
if this project goes forward, it'll become essentially a barn. It's going to have a wooden house by it. It's going to move. It's going to have wooden features, which Lori D. Batista is going to talk about a little bit when she gets up here. And, and we'd like to think that the new style of the buildings of a more in keeping with the agricultural history of East Tennessee. Talks about public health, safety, and welfare. Well, we don't believe there's anything that we're going to do here that's going to adversely impact, uh, affect public health, safety, and welfare. Talks about residential impacts. Uh, in the case of a proposal located directly adjacent to a residential zone. And we have some residential zones. We have some to the east, we have some to the north. But again, to remind you, our neighbors to the west are not zoned residential, they're zoned business. And in fact, they've been used for business in years past. We have a daycare center uh, that's located in one of the houses for 50 years, and it's still all zoned business. Although, in terms of this application, we're going to treat it as residential, it's residential use. Um, in terms of impacts, the location and size of this proposed use, well, the building's still there. It's always been there. It's been there for probably, I don't know, 25 years, maybe, maybe a little longer, I'm not sure. And we feel we're going to be enhancing the building. Uh, we think it's an upgrade to the building. And we don't think anything that we're going to do here is really going to impact the area of the residents. Nature and intensity of operations involved in conducting in connection with the proposed use, something that needs to consider. Site layout, regulation of access to the streets in the proposed use. Well, that's a kind of a traffic issue. Scott's going to talk about that. And a traffic impact study where we have that. Scott's going to talk about that. Um, and we get down to several on that nine and two requirements, a lot about traffic, parking spaces, and so forth. Levels of service, uh, peaks, AM, PM peaks, and, and staff's going to go into some of that information with you as well. So we believe that we need the special permit findings that our plan is a good plan, it's a solid plan, um, and that you have enough information to approve such a plan based on what we read here in the special permit requirements what we have submitted to you. You also have a staff memo. And there's some information in there. There's some things that we need to address. However, there's nothing in here that's earth shattering. They're pretty simple things. Uh, some questions on landscaping, uh, which we can address. Uh, there's a question about the memo from one more in your town engineer. And he recommended that the travel study be submitted. To the police department or your travel authority. I don't assume that's happened, but we have heard back from the travel authority that I'm sure. In meetings tomorrow night. In meetings they have it. Yes. Okay. And they have it. So I'm sure we will hear some feedback on how we can talk about it at the next meeting. Um, <clears throat> we do have a memo from the fire marshal. He had a couple of comments about radiuses. Uh, in a fire lead marking, all simple things to address. The police staff had a question about the land. <coughs> Photometric plan detail sheets, uh, one full cutoff. And so we need to provide you with some, some cut sheets. Uh, they are all full cutoff, but it's got a compliant fixture. So We'll get that information for you for the next meeting so you can take a look at it. The landscape buffer requirement was talked about in the staff memo. And 
We're showing a berm and landscaping. The berm's about five to six feet high. Your regulation talks about a solid fence. Um, certainly, we can add a fence. Um, do we need a fence of the room? Not sure whether that's something we can discuss as we move forward. Uh, some more plantings, certainly that's something we can provide in terms of staggered rows of different types of planting right now with other varieties. And we can add some other evergreen plants. So we'll be taking a look at that and addressing uh, the comment on uh, landscape buffer. So <clears throat> that's a basic overview of the application. And discussing a little bit your POCD, uh, the requirements in terms of the special permit, and you know, what you need to think about and improve this. We think we meet the requirements within the special permit. And a little bit about your farm regulation and how we got to where we are today. So I think at this point, I'd like to have Scott Hesker come up and talk to you a little bit about this. Traffic report, traffic impact statement, again, which is required in the in your special permit requirements. Thank you, Jay. Good evening. For the record, my name is Scott Heskett. I'm a licensed engineer, state of Connecticut. For FFA Heskett and Associates, our office is in East Grammy, Connecticut. <clears throat> and I'm the author of the November 7, 2022 traffic statement that has been submitted in support of this application. <clears throat> we were contacted and asked to take a look at the traffic, potential traffic impacts from this proposed development and to apply as to whether or not the local roadway network is capable of accommodating the traffic to be generated by the particular developer. In order to do that, we obtained traffic volume accounts from the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Uh, the Connecticut Department of Transportation maintains traffic volume counts on all state highways and many local roadways. They do counts on typically on a three year cycle. Uh, the latest traffic volumes uh, conducted out here in the vicinity were conducted from February 2019, which was uh, pre COVID. Uh, the DOT had counts on Route 191, Scantic Road, uh, North of Cemetery Road, where they observed an average of uh, 2,500 vehicles on a daily basis. Peak hour volumes of 317 during the morning peak and 267 during the afternoon peak. Route 191 South Cemetery Road had an aggregate traffic volume of 950 vehicles, with peak hours of approximately 100 vehicles during both the morning and afternoon peaks. A scanning road had an ADT of 1,700, peak hours of 225 and 163. A cemetery road had a Every day they traffic line about 2,000 peak hour of 199 in the morning and 202 during the afternoon. So you can see that the, all roadways in the general vicinity have relatively light traffic volumes, according to the Department of Transportation Pass. Uh, Jay has explained to you the, uh, the site plan that's before you. And um, typically, when we do site generated traffic for proposed developments, we look at the Institute of Transportation Engineers. It's a standard engineering reference. They give us Data based on counts conducted at existing facilities that we could use to project traffic volumes for proposed developments. Unfortunately, they don't then include the uh, banquet facilities that have one of their land uses. So we're, we're a little stuck on that. But um, again, the pro proposed facility here is for approximately 250 guests or, uh, or our people on site and uh, consistent with the parking ratios of one space for three uh, attendees. Uh, it's generally appropriate that um, uh, the trip generation ratio would, would be similar to that. So, uh, in projecting a, a, a facility for 250 guests, uh, we would project that uh, you'd expect approximately 83 uh, entering trips in the hour preceding an event. Maybe a handful of them would drop somebody off and leave. So, perhaps 10% of the people would drop somebody off. So, another eight people would. Vehicles would leave. So we're looking at a peak hour volume of about 91 trips, 83 entering and 8 exiting. And that would generally occur within the, the hour before an event takes place. Um, and then you would have similar uh, types of volumes uh, exiting the facility. 
in the in the hours after the, the event has occurred. Uh, generally, uh, vehicles leaving the event would occur over a longer period of time. Some people would leave during the middle. Some people would stay till the very end. So uh, generally, we're looking at the peak entering traffic, which would likely occur uh, perhaps uh, midday uh, weekends or perhaps five or six o'clock in the evenings, um, generally during the uh, the peak peak time. Um, we're projecting here perhaps um, 30 employees um, and, and deliveries. They might receive you know, up to 20 deliveries. So on a, on a day where an event is taking place, we'd anticipate perhaps 268 trips in total uh, to the facility. In looking at the local roadway network, how people arrive to and depart from the facility, uh, you've got several roadways going in multiple directions. Um, today with GPS, uh, people starting where they are using GPS would find the shortest route. So we anticipate that the traffic volumes to and from the facility would generally be about 25% in each of the four cardinal directions, uh, depending on which way you're coming from. So <clears throat> with the peak of our line of about 90 trips, we're looking at maybe 25 additional trips on any one segment of roadway uh, in, in the hour before or after a facility. Again, um, we looked at the capacity analysis of the proposed site driveway intersection in Cemetery Road. Again, Cemetery Road has a peak hour volume of about 200 trips. And if our event happened to occur simultaneously with the peak hour of Cemetery Road, uh, we looked at the analysis in, 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 from that perspective. We looked at both a peak entering hour and a peak exiting hour because this type of facility generally most everyone's driving at once or leaving at once. So based on those uh, traffic volume numbers and the distribution in the site driveway, we could have about 75% exiting and making a right-hand turn and 25% exiting and making a left-hand turn from the site driveway. We still get levels of service at the site driveway of A on all approaches, which means average delay of less than 10 seconds of the vehicle at the site driveway. So it gives us pretty good confidence that we've got uh, excellent levels of service here. Now, we didn't do turning movement counts at each of the uh, intersections of the triangle with the traffic volumes uh, that the Department of Transportation had. Uh, we believe we have levels of service A and B at those locations as well. So, the, the main point here is what's the safety of the, of the proposed site driveway uh, intersection. We had observations out in the field, and based on our observations in the field, uh, we've got intersection site distances measured about me measured 10 feet from the edge of roadway, approximately 450 feet looking to the left. And the site distance which extends uh, to the intersection of Scantic Road while looking to the right. These site distances are adequate for approach speeds of 40 to 42 miles per hour, respectively. And Cemetery Road is posted to 35 miles per hour. So we, we believe we have good levels, uh, I mean, good site distance. People should be able to enter and exit the facility safely uh, and be seen uh, by the uh, traffic. <clears throat> because we're looking at a volume of left traffic into the site, we did a review to see if a left turn lane would be warranted at the site driveway location. Um, based on our review of the, of the common idea, a left turn lane is not warranted with the good levels of service uh, and with the, the volume of traffic that we're looking at. Uh, left turn lane is not part of that at this particular location. Now, Cemetery Road <coughs> is our main access point. It's 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 uh provides 22 feet of pavement with a single travel lane in each direction. It's a painted double in the center line. Again, the roadway is posted at 35 miles per hour. I believe the roadway meets you know, town standards uh, for, for, for a rural type roadway that's generally level and tangent so that there are no significant limitations to site distance for, for traffic traveling up and down the roadway. We reviewed the accident data from the Connecticut Department, uh, I'm sorry, the University of Connecticut crash data. Uh, we looked at um, the area. Um, within a, a thousand feet of the intersection, basically, and the entire length of um, the cemetery road for the last three year period. 
the uh, data indicates there have been total of 12 accidents involving 22 vehicles over that time. 11 of the 12 accidents were uh, property damage only, and only one accident involved a possible injury. And most of the accidents uh, involved two vehicles. So uh, only a few accidents involved a fixed object, which means that the roadways are generally well designed. Um, people are not going off the roadways in, 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 in locations because of curvature or more poor design. So we believe that the roadways are adequately designed, especially to carry the, the volume of traffic which are, which are utilized in the roadways. So based on the existing traffic volumes uh, of the vicinity, based on the projection of state generated traffic from this proposed development, based on the capacity analysis of the on the site driveway intersection, it is our my professional opinion that the local roadway network has sufficient capacity to accommodate the traffic volumes from this proposed development, and that the local roadway network uh, is sufficient to accommodate that traffic volume in a safe and efficient manner. Uh, if the commission has any specific questions related to traffic, I'd be happy to address them at the at the appropriate time or whenever the commission feels it's, it's appropriate. At this time, I'll hand the microphone back over to Jay. And uh, just some additional comments there soon. Thank you, Scott. So I think at this time I'd like to have more of the people at DSR that come up and, and share with you uh, some of the renderings and elevations that she's put together and, and talk a little bit about uh, the renovations and modifications that are going to be made to the building uh, again to, to put it more in the perspective of a public farm if you will versus the nice skin and <clears throat> in industrial looking building and currently it is now. Good evening. I'm Lori Gabatista. I'm a structural architectural engineer. I'm registered in the state of Connecticut as well as, uh, as uh, Scott is. Thank you for having me tonight. I look forward to going over these plans with you. Um, the renovation to the barn, uh, as everyone knows, it's a metal building. It's been there for a while and pretty rusty. So our internal um, renovation very through the following. The main portion of the barn is going to be an open space. And that is about just about 5,000 square feet, square feet. So it's all open for people to enjoy. Um, we've got exterior doors for people to come in. The entry will be covered by a covered portico and also have a, a post and beam type of look to it. And then once you get in, there is a small kitchen. Now, that kitchen is only for warming purposes only. So when the table come, they can get their food and get it prepared into the warming rooms so it can be served properly. There's also some sanitary facilities for the folks who are going to be there. We have a max of 250 people that will be hosting at the facility for an event. On the back side of the room that faces towards the open field, we have a nice walkway that's all glass and windows, and then a covered patio area that's actually part of the building itself. So when it's nice summer days, all these doors can open up and you can get the field or be in the field. But it's also covered. So if it rains, you can still be in general view. As I mentioned before, these two main entrances, these are the two portals that are, that are part of it. Um, so as you know, those who've been past it is nationally known as the blue, the blue barn. When we get down, we get by as the red barn. So the, as I spoke before, these are my beautiful porticos that we protect the main entries. The side here that faces towards the field have all the open doors. All these doors will be aluminum flat on the outside. They'll be black on color. And on the inside will be wood because the finished inside will be very much barn like. The roof system will be asphalt ceiling or can be asphalt ceiling. And also we get complement it with cupolas too so that light can be shining in on that open space. So those cupolas. Those people up are basically right here, so natural light will get into that open space for people to enjoy. The back uh, wall that faces the residential area, there's no windows at all. 
the building will be brought up to the 2009 building and fire code. All the insulation will be foam insulation, so it has a high, even a higher value than the uh, energy code requires. Um, and all the interior will be more of a post and wing look. So it does have that exterior and interior bar look. Um, if you have any questions, I have an answer for you. I think we'll do all of our questions once you're done with your presentation. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I think one thing just to mention in terms of, of the building itself and the building and the renovation, which what I mentioned is that the entire interior of the building will be uh, we'll have a, an application of spray foam insulation now. Uh, and many of you have seen that before, or uh, have been introduced to it when you maybe used it at your home or see it in another building. But I had the opportunity to see it a few years back in the renovation of the home. And, and it's quite impressive. In fact, that not only does it have the insulating value, it has sound deadening value, which we feel is important in this application, as well as some structural value. Um, you can spray this stuff on, and it really almost becomes a structural member of the building. Not that it's necessary here for this building, but it's uh, it's a it's a tremendous product in this particular application. Uh, we think it will work well in terms of being able to, to make the building as energy efficient as it can be, as well as a sound deadening uh, insulation, which I'm sure is going to be a concern when we get to talking about some of the the things that could possibly be put in the building. So I just wanted to mention the aspect of the, of the renovation. But I think at this point, uh, we can conclude our presentation. Uh, certainly, I'd like to reserve the right to come up and maybe comment on some other things that, that may come up in terms of uh, referring to these comments and maybe some of the public. But again, assuming we're probably going to continue this and be back to see you again at some point. Um, we may just wait until that point in time to, to address all the comments, but at this time, uh, I think this concludes our, our presentation. Thank you, Jay. Okay, we'll start down the end. Do you have any uh, questions for any of the presenters? I um, have questions for the presenters and for town staff. Okay. I'll start with the traffic um, engineer. And um, when I come up from the road and cut across the cemetery, I find the sight line there very challenging. Um, for the right. When you looked at accidents, you were talking about cemeteries. Well, have there been accidents associated with that? intersection because it's not a standard speed intersection. But I'm there, I'm kind of at a certain angle and I can't see well to the right. Am I clear on the spot I always have this Well let's see over there's a switch here. Okay. If you were to come up from the high school and you come to the stop sign and you want to go straight. It's very hard to look to the right and your left. Well, let's yeah, see. Yeah. There is there are two accidents listed on Trolley Road over the last three year period. Um, one is about 3,400 feet west of the intersection of Bells Road. The other one's two tenths of a mile west of Bells Road. So those two are on that major second. Um, 191 is on the Lake Road, there's one 880 feet west. There looks like there's one, two, three, four accidents that potentially could be at the intersection. And those are angled accidents. Again, I, I can't give you specifically yeah, the accident, I, I but, have a hard time with that but yeah, and see, there does appear to be a number of accidents that are particular location. It's a slight one challenge for me. It's done where that. I'll say the window bar is on the car to see down the road. Um, it wasn't clear to me in the overall presentation how many events per year you are thinking you will have. 
if there's a number or it hasn't been determined. So I was curious on that. On the um, noise you talked about sound deadening inside the building. I'm wondering um, if you looked at the acoustics of the doors all being open and the patio and how that noise would impact all the names. Um, my other question is <clears throat> when you have potentially 100, 200, however many vehicles that need to park there, have you thought about EV charging as we move to a future of electric vehicles? And if that's a part of the plan. And then my question for town staff is when I read the um, handbook for planning and zoning commissioners written by attorney Stephen Byrne that was revised March 2017, which is the document we have been given by town staff. Um, if you look at page 16, it's very clear that a special permits have to satisfy the zoning regulations. And um, the board's function is really to determine if the applicant's proposed <coughs> use is permitted and the standards are satisfied. And the only way I understand it can be denied is if it fails to meet a standard in the regulation. Um, and basically, the way I'm interpreting that guidance is if it satisfies the regulations, we have no choice but to approve it. Is that a correct interpretation of the law and our rules? The way I see it is yes, I was doing some research, commission, some information out to the commissioners earlier in the day. Um, the special Louder. permit process. Louder. Okay, I will get the microphone. Okay, so to answer the question, you don't want to hear that. There we go. Now you know. So, um, special permits can be denied. The reasons for the denial have to be on the record, and we can point back to Chapter 700, or if the use was not expressly permitted, right? So, the application here, based on the agricultural chapter, the event hall, the banquet halls, is listed. And then, um, the special permit is where you start to think about the UCC and the compatibility, public health and safety, and that raises the conditions that can be put on the permit. So if there is a minimum setback requirement from the property of an abutter, and it's X number of feet, if that's a minimum, can a condition be applied that increases that distance or <clears throat> that's not a fair condition because conditions have to be reasonable. I would think based on the facts that come in, if it seems a mitigating factor would be different. I think that's reasonable. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else, Sam? That was my question. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Dave? I'm good right now. You good? I'm going to reserve it later. Okay. So, so you, you mentioned 83 spaces, and then you mentioned 30 employees. So where are all the employees supposed to park? Number one. Number two, this traffic report is from February 2019. Which is probably right around COVID, pre-COVID, or right around COVID. So I would like to see a more accurate 
traffic report because you have a lot of assumed and a lot of estimated wordage in this report. I know you went off the DLT um, guidelines. I thought when you guys did traffic reports, you guys actually put trippers in the road. Is that how that works usually for up to date traffic report? These are just questions. Do you want to answer them now or just? Well, he doesn't have to Okay. Do you want to wait? Well, I have some questions for you also. So, and then also you mentioned 250 people, and there's not a mention of, of truck deliveries or any kind of. If you have 250 people for an event, you're gonna have some big trucks going in and out of there. You know, could be 18 wheelers, could be big box trucks. There's no mention of that either. And the other question, last question I had was. What's to prevent this from going in any property this size across each window? Let's say if I had 40 acres, it was A1, and I wanted to put up an event hosting place in, on my property. What's to stop that from happening? Because there's a ton of properties in East Windsor that are A1 that are this size parcel and can do the same thing. That's all I have for now. <clears throat> Okay, um, when it come, as far as the traffic study, uh, the facts or the numbers that you presented us kind of assumed a private one seating event. If you had a event open to the public, there's really no way to control how many, it's a, a craft fair, for example. There's no way to judge or control how many vehicles are coming in and out. Um, how do you regulate that you don't exceed capacity or once you run out of parking spaces, you're going to have people <clears throat> circling and looping around looking for places to park, which next ends up on the lawn or across the street or wherever they can find it and they start walking to the event. So are you proposing that it's only going to be private events held there or there's going to be public events also? Because on a private event, you can control the number of people in a public event, you cannot. Um, and then for the architectural, you mentioned the spray foam does have some sound deadening cap uh, characteristics to it. Do you have any type of uh, data, uh, cut sheets or anything to say that it reduces it by 10% the decibels or any, any measurable number that can be applied to what exactly the amount of sound deadening it would provide? Um, also, do you plan on doing any actual testing um, putting in, you know, uh, live music or loud music into the building and testing de decibel changes at the property lines, anything <clears throat> to that effect. Um, let's see what's the have here. The, the last thing I kind of have here is looking at this farm rig and other uses. Of all the permitted uses that are in here between field worker housing, as you mentioned, horse boarding, farm stores, everything else in here is, I would consider to be agriculturally related. You know, kennels, sawmills, all that. So are you going to limit your events to only agriculturally related type events or anything goes. Anybody who wants to rent it, anything goes. <clears throat> Those are all the questions I have at this moment. Does staff have any questions I'd like to pose? Uh, just to clarify the water, that's by way of well, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I do, that did trigger one of the, me, the uh, memo that came from the fire marshal today did uh, state a request for sprinklering. Are you going to uh, address that also with the fire marshal? Because um, that's quite a task when you're on the well water. Okay. Okay, now the fun part. <clears throat> this is a public hearing. So uh, I wanna try to keep this as orderly as possible. Uh, please raise your hand, I'll, I'll acknowledge you, come step forward to the podium, uh, put your name down and 
state, state your case. So uh, I know in the opening comments it said that we wanted to have pros and cons and neutral. Uh, I don't know if that will go well in this venue here, but uh, I guess let's give it a try. Anybody who wants to speak in, in favor of this uh, proposal, please raise your hand and we'll give you the opportunity to speak. Yes. Yes, you may come up and speak. Yes. <clears throat> Nancy Masters Restaurant. And if you just look at this building, which we raised a million dollars to build 22 years ago, it took us seven years to raise that million dollars. We have had events here for 22 years. Birthdays, weddings, showers, all of the youth events, all of the forage events. Go to our website, take a look at what we have heard. This particular room holds 297 people by graduation. We cut that back voluntarily to 200 people. We just didn't think it was appropriate to try to bring in that many people in here. And on top of this building here, we also have a woman, we have a pond, we have four pavilions, we have a campsite out there. So not only are we holding events here within this building, without a single event or criticism or anything for 22 years. And we have served the youth. The summer camp has come here. No problems. And in order to rent this facility, not only do you have to make a phone call or submit something through the internet, I kind of interview you on the phone. You have to come into this building and meet with me personally and go through what it is we expect of you when you have your event here. And if I don't even deem that your event meets our regulations, you don't even get to come through the building. And if you're touring the building and I'm hearing this, what you want to do, we just say, I'm sorry, but we don't own the people sitting on this particular committee are also sitting on the This building sits on town land, and we gave this building to the town. This you're sitting in a town building. However, we do everything, pay all the bills related to this building, but it is a tender. Okay. Historical society would allow, can allow alcohol. We would only allow certified bartenders for X number of hours. And when that's ending, alcohol stops and it probably would only be related to wine and beer. That's one way to control that temperature. It's never even been brought up here, but I'm extremely concerned about that because I sit on both committees. And as I said, we have no incidents, no complaints. We have the neighbors there, and we have the neighbors right next door. And on the historical society, right across the street at the into church, dinners, auctions, weddings, showers, um, no problems. Absolutely no problems, just like we have here. Probably almost the same distance as the barn that we are thinking of. And if you look at some of the buildings in town, such as Merlot on the Water, German Club, the McMeg restaurant, the opera house, they all have neighbors. 
what men do. And Jeremy Club holds events inside and outside with neighbors right there. The Murray, um, the Nutmeg, right along the entire back parking lot against the fences is a whole development. And they have inside and outside because they're outside in you know, the courtyard. So I don't think we've had any problems in the town with any of those particular events serving alcohol, having weddings, having showers, out to dinner, etc. And I'm not seeing any difference between that and what we're doing. And St. Catherine Church, let's go for a good thing. St. Catherine Church held tag sales for so many years, right on the corner of Route 140 and Main Street at Broadway. Hundreds of people, 110 blue space for that. For 25 years, Stan and Rosalie Chester and myself ran those for 25 years. And then the Broadway Fire Department would come in and hold their carnivals right there with the neighbors right next door. And if we were fortunate, somebody in town came for the fireworks and everybody loved them. This thing with the fire department and warehouse band. They have people housing right next to them. And before they expanded, they held carnivals. I'm not saying we are interested in holding carnivals, but those are density population areas in town that have had no problems. No problems here. No problems St. Catherine Church. No problem with the Congregational Church. Um, I think people are getting a little upset or worried of what we're going to do. Um, and I just want to add with one thing. It's very, very easy to put a sign in the front yard. It takes no effort. It's awfully hard to do what you do, I do, all of these other people who have volunteered 25, 30, 40 years of their time to make this town what it is and to try to make it a good town. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Hello, Corey. This is a Ken Rice for Broadbrook, Connecticut. Um, although I don't live anywhere close to the venue. Um, I have lived on Rice Road for just about 42 years. Um, that neighborhood, even though it's so far to Broadway, has changed nicely. Um, the church that was added off the 140 that's in the cross the street in the backyard, so you know you don't want to come from there. It's to be expected on a Sunday morning or Saturday night when we have these groups. Um, they own the property, they have the right to do what they want. The historical society. Um, has done a tremendous job over the years um, providing um, for the historical value of East Windsor and putting on function that everyone I have ever attended that's been done in very controlled and orderly fashion. I haven't heard any negativity at all. Um, the Historical Society um, puts the bills with their fundraisers. As everybody knows, the cost of living is going up, the cost of expenses is going up. This added building will help them to continue their work for the town of East Windsor and will help them to keep in to pay their bills in a timely fashion. Um, not that they're not. Um, you struggle when you're doing fundraising and people pocket type 
but there's really no place in your school that you have a new formal type of old building, such as this barn. If you want to put on an informal wedding, if you want to put in an informal um, gathering. Uh, so I think they should be given the opportunity to do that. Um, and Logan commented earlier about the sight line problem that she's having. Um, and I agree, not for the reason that she gave, um, we'll see that, but there is a slight problem there. Um, but it's one step further. I would just take a look at the traffic flow and the stop signs that are here. This is what I feel is the much needed stop sign coming from um, the road that comes down to the cemetery because it's no stop sign there. There's one coming on the front, there's one to the left, there's one in front of the church. But then you got that free flow of traffic there. And if you're not familiar with an area, I can see where that might create a problem for people that are familiar with it. But other than that, um, I can mention for a job well done up there. I'm sure they will continue as they have the last 25 years. And I do hope we want to give my condolences to also one of the recent members on uh, John for Jumper. We have done a lot of things at the historical society. Um, so, if we're taking vote tonight, I would ask for that one change on the traffic procedure to look at that and allow them to get the change. You can always do something later on to just create the problem. And I don't think people, people have to vote in the last ten thousand for they do. Yes. So, speaking of them, gonna ask. Don John, it's on. It's on. Okay. So here's the deal. Please, John, identify yourself. I'd like to have yeah, John. Can, please identify yourself. Oh, John, one seven days Scanner Road, East Windsor, Connecticut. I've lived on Scanner Road since 1960. Quite a long time. I would like to be able to reserve my comments until I hear some of the objections. If there are any, I don't think it would be any tonight. Just going to be objections so I can maybe address concerns. Are you going to hold fast to the four, the against, the maybes? I don't want this to turn into a back and forth. Yeah. So I would like to take in all the comments and then maybe at our next meeting, then we can address once we have the time and the ability to formulate answers to all the comments. My question is, will I have a chance after I hear the names to talk? Your take, you sit there All right, here we go. This is a great idea. I've lived in Scanning since 1906. Nobody loves Scanning more than I do. Uh, the East Windsor Historical Society was started in 1965. My mother happened to be a charter member of the Stone and others. They moved buildings in there, they preserved history, they run a class operation. Uh, some of you have 55 years or 65 years or something, a long time. It's going to continue to go like that. I've been part of Scout Hall since the beginning. We have, as Nancy mentioned, we have had no problems here. The Board of Directors. East Windsor Historical Society Incorporated, Board of Directors, all the shots. We're the ones, well, obviously, I mean, that's your point. But we're the ones that say uh, 8.30 is the curfew time, 9 o'clock, you're out of here. We do not want to have problems with our neighbors, and, and it might happen. We do not want to have problems. We are your neighbors. We want the society to be preserved. We want to be able to make income into the future. Now, let me address the income situation. In 1993, <clears throat> after about 20 other groups tried to do this very building, we, we finally put a group together and we made it happen. And the old two of the benefactors and other things, but the only reason this building survived and it's going to survive into the future is because they have the revenue stream. They're not dependent on tax dollars. We provide, we produce our own money, and that's what we're looking to do at the society. The blue, the blue barn will have some income generating capacity. And how many events per year? I don't know. You never know. You never know what type of thing. 
and we talk about the ice cream social where flea markets or something, people come in and kind of a, a cloudy day can turn a well planned event into nothing. The last ice cream social we had turned out wonderful because the day was nice. We had the traffic cop, we had the permission from the town to have the event. We, we do our diligence trying to make this work good. We have insurance at the kazoo, the board of directors have insurance. Okay. We're not looking to have this be a problem. We're looking for the society to be able to sell this today into the future. I guess I guess. I think it's a great idea. There it is. Anyone else in favor that would like to speak? Okay, I will take the uh, opposing comments now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just get some. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Mark Needleman. I'm an attorney with an office in Bloomfield. By way of background, I have practiced municipal and zoning law for over 32 years. I'm currently the town attorney in Bloomfield. I am familiar with this community, even though I am from Bloomfield. I've represented the Broad Road Fire Department in its recent uh, arrangement with the town to, to merge, if you will, that is really legally the right term, but uh, to work with the town uh, as an agent of the town and the, the joint venture, I think is probably the best way to describe it. I've represented the East Windsor Housing Authority and several of your residents. Uh, I'm now representing Gail Boyvert and several of her neighbors who are immediately abutting. I'm going to hand out a for you copies of what I'll be presenting. Um, I'll hand one to the town planner, which I would ask to be made part of the record. Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm going to start with uh, some orientation. I took page seven of the applicant's plan and I colored it in. Um, I'm not a uh, surveyor or engineer. Um, I'm certainly no artist, but I, I did my best here. And let me let me orient you. Um, the pink lines are are the lines. The water drainage lines, if you will, the stormwater drainage lines. And you each have a, a duplicate smaller one in the packet. You're looking at the top sheet. All of these drainage system lines end up either going directly off site into a farm pond owned by uh, Bud Abbott and his wife, or into the newly created a stormwater system right by the property line 
which is actually designed to flow directly across the property line into the Abbott property. Now, the stormwater drainage report, according to its own terms and as part of the record, uh, took into account the physical premises uh, owned by the historical site, and that's certainly correct. However, However, what it did not include, and I read it several times, it did not include the property across the street, which would be to the west, where there is a storm drain that flows under the street through a neighbor's property into the site and all the way to the farm pond. So all of this acreage, which I think, John, you own, uh, all of this acreage, the water flow, and I'll show you uh, some photographs, mm -hmm. flows towards this catch basin, which then flows into the property and into the pond. All that was not taken into account. So I respectfully suggest that uh, the study is hardly conclusive and hardly accurate um, if it didn't take into account all of this acreage and the fact that it drains in this fashion. This is the blue barn, outlined in blue. The existing barn buildings, the existing historical buildings, and then let's talk about the neighbors. You know, I've heard that, well, you know, they're in a, uh, a business district and technically they are. For some reason, this area right here was designated business, but what do we have there? A house that was built in the 17, 18, early 1800s. We have a house in the 60s, 70s, Okay, uh, we have another house, which is a much older house right here. We have the Abbott property and their homestead here. Now, I guess a couple people said last time when we had the hearing, Gene Needleman, you really uh, dropped the bomb. You threw the hand grenade into that uh, meeting. I don't know if that's a fair uh, description. Um, I pointed out what the law called for and required. Um, I feel obligated to uh, point out this evening. Again, some may say it's, it's a blob and a hand rate, but the entire drainage study, not including everything from across the street, mm -hmm. look where it goes. It goes right across the property line into Bud Abbott's property. And all the plans say, Proposed easement, 50 to 60 feet wide. And I've outlined that in orange. Proposed easement. In other words, the entire drainage plan is dependent on a proposed easement across Bud Abbott's property. Um, he's here uh, and will speak for himself, but he's made it very clear to me. Um, there is no easement. There will be no easement. And he's not interested in having all the water from across the street and his property channeled onto his property. Would you? So I don't I don't see the plan can't work. It's not a matter whether it's a good plan or a bad plan, it's deficient in the sense that it relies totally, totally on discharging and surface flowing the entire water flows onto the neighbor's property and they propose to obtain an easement so they can continue the water all the way through the cemetery and then dumping into the Scantic River. They're not going to get the proposed easement, so I just don't know how it's going to work, but we can address that later. Um, the Areas outlined in black, and I'll show you perhaps better on this.
and I took page four of the applicant's plans. The areas in black, or black hatch, are all impervious surfaces, meaning water can't penetrate. There is additional area, this gray area around the blue barn and here and here. Those are all papers. Some water can get through, but clearly a lot will sheet flow. So this pavement is here now. So we now have proposed all of this impervious service, which is going to obviously diminish the amount of land, soil that is available to absorb water, which means one of two things. Either it has to sheet across, or if the design is good, it will be incorporated within the stormwater system. And oh look, if it's going to go to Bud Abbott's property, or maybe first to the detention pond, which discharges into Bud Abbott's property with the notation proposed easement from Schultz. Again, there'll be no proposed easement from Schultz. Uh, the pink are the existing uh, homes that uh, I've already referenced. Again, just so you get a sense. Now, the area from the edge of the barn to the fence that currently exists with these two neighbors, Eighty feet. Eighty feet. Um, this this room I'm going to guess you know for sure, but um, I'm going to guess because I do this based on the length of the fire hose. Twenty five, forty feet, fifty, fifty, fifty seven. Okay, fifty seven. So add another twenty two, three feet. That's the distance in between. There is a visual berm proposed. Um, apparently, the staff is calling for more plantings. Um, so there's a little area here left, which a small vehicle, a tractor would get through. Um, certainly not fire engines. Certainly not firefighting equipment, should not forbid there be a fire here. The best they could do is position in this corner and maybe that corner, um, try to direct water streams. Um, but this side is going to have exposure. And look how close these two homes are 110 feet, 115 feet. Um, they're not going to be able to stay in those homes if there's a real fire here. Um, they're going to have to evacuate pretty quickly. Let me make clear this evening what I told you last time, and I mean it with all sincerity, and, and so do my clients. This is not about the historical society. There are fine organizations that have done a lot for the community. We're going to do, I'm sure, more for the community. The only question is you know, what they do, how they do it, when they do it. And is it in the best interest of the community or some individuals, or we don't know what? Um, it's about the plan and the place, not whether. It's the historical society or anyone else. I provided you with uh, legal size pages and I go through the analysis, um, starting off with the application itself and the use, whether it conforms to the plan of conservation and development, POCD. Interestingly enough, both I and my clients, when we were listening, to Jay Uzzeri's uh, explanation said, you know, we kind of agree on a lot of, of what he says, 
we just have a different take on it. Um, so, plan of conservation development is a planning tool according to its reading for the future growth of the community. It offers guidance for the overall conservation, preservation, and growth of our town. That's page one of the plan of conservation development. Also, on page one, it says the plan and zoning commission must and should utilize the POCD when making land use decisions. Must. Not it would be nice, not will be guided by, but must. It is the responsibility, as noted on page four, of the staff, boards, and commissions, and residents to work together to meet these goals. So it's not just the staff, it's not just the board the commission, but it's everyone in town has an obligation to work together towards this. The primary strategy, and you've heard this before, and this is what I'm saying, we don't disagree on what the guiding principles are, we just we have a different take. Page eight says, preservation of more, of more open space, is one of the most effective and comprehensive strategies that East Windsor can follow to achieve the plan's visions. More open space on page eight. Land that is undeveloped or in use for agricultural or recreational purposes may also be perceived as open space. However, such land, if if often not firmly protected for future development. In other words, yes, you can use it for certain other uses, but it has to be firmly protected from future development. Open space priorities, page nine of the plan of conservation development. The priorities are preservation of farming and farmland, protection of rivers, streams, and groundwater sources. Protection of rivers, streams, and groundwater sources. Assuming, for argument's sake, that the applicant obtained the easement and the legal right to dump all this water and direct all this water onto his neighbor's property and direct it through the stream bed, through the cemetery property, and ultimately into the Scantic River. Sounds to me like the plan does not provide for the protection of rivers, streams, and groundwater. I've included in certain pages the plan of conservation development, as did the applicant. Uh, I'm not going to read them all to you. I'm sure you either are familiar with them or will familiarize yourself with them. I would like to direct you to the farm regulations of your zoning plans, section 305 in particular. The farm regulations purpose, and I believe this is page 18 of your regulations, page 18, section 305.1. The purpose of this section is to promote the preservation of agricultural land, preservation of agricultural land and support agriculture as an important and viable business and lifestyle within the town of East Windsor while preserving the public health and safety. Uh, we respectfully suggest, and you see on the notes on the right, a column of yes and no, and I didn't allude to it before. Um, it's our position that uh, it does not comply with that provision. Section 305.7 says, where dry aisles and parking are required, and obviously dry aisles and parking is required for something like this, permeable services are encouraged. Permeable being not by totalness, but sand, gravel, similar dirt, but I'm not suggesting dirt is the answer but things that allow rainwater, stormwater uh, to go directly into the ground. So permeable services are encouraged. Um, you can see the black 
on that plan, that's all impermeable and the gray is semi. So I don't think they've met this requirement. There was some discussion, and this is in page four, section 200.2 .2 of your regulations concerning your interpretation of the regulations and special permit requirements or not. And, and this go when you ask about, for instance, a side yard requirement, is that a minimum requirement and does that uh, set the standard, if you will? Um, your regulations say in their interpretation and application, the provisions of these regulations shall be held to be the minimum requirements. You're expressly told that these are the minimum, not the maximum, the minimum requirements. If something's the minimum requirement, that suggests to me that there may be plenty of room to uh, work with it. And so yeah. we've indicated in the no column that the application doesn't fit. I included the cited farm regulations uh, on the next couple pages. The outline continues with a special permit findings. Again, we discussed a little bit about that. That's section 701. 701.1, so the very first thing says, you've got to find, make a finding in order to grant a special permit. You must make a finding, quote, that the proposed use is in general accordance with the relevant provisions of the plan of conservation and development. Now I could go back to page one and I can repeat all that, but I, you're familiar with it. You heard so I'm not going to take that additional time. You can flip back to it. This doesn't cut the mustard, and that's why you see a, a big X in the no column. Section 701.2a says you must specifically find that the proposed use shall be of such location, size, and character that in general it will be in harmony with the appropriate and orderly development of adjacent properties. Well, the adjacent properties are four or five homes. Those are the most adjacent. We have a church three, 400 feet away. Um, yes, there is the existing historical society buildings. And um, candidly, we, we do believe that there are in harmony with the existing neighbors um, and have no issue with that, okay? But what's being proposed is a far cry from what exists now. Section 701.2C says that in order for you to issue or grant a special permit, you must find that the proposed use will not alter the essential characteristics of the area or adversely affect property value in the neighborhood. If you own one of the homes adjoining this property and you were getting ready to try to sell it, is there any doubt in your mind that if this application were granted and this use was allowed, that it would adversely affect your property value? Really? I mean, we're talking about an event space, several hundred people at a time, cars, trucks, limousines, buses, serving and selling liquor. You know, we heard a lot about this facility and it's a beautiful one and, and it's great to have it. Um, and it's alluded to, but not really talk much about it. one of the big differences, big differences, and I saw it walking in, I didn't know, no liquor permitted. Listen, I, I like the drinker too, I'm sure many of you do and the people behind me here, but I think it makes a big difference, okay? Um, it goes to the heart of whether this is an appropriate use 
in this particular location. We're talking here about music and noise into the late night. You know, we've heard that they can set limitations, but in order for you to make a finding, I suppose you would have to arguably say, yeah, no event past 8.30, uh, and there better not be any bodies there after 9. Um, for an event where alcohol was served and, you know, a wedding, whatever, um, not really realistic, I don't think. Um, Section 701.3A of your regulations, in order to grant a special permit, you have to make a finding that the streets providing access to the proposed use are adequate in width. Adequate in width. Um, I spoke with several uh, officials here in town, including your town engineer. And I don't know if he's here and I don't speak for him, but when I asked him about the 20 foot road, and that's what he told me it was, not 22, two feet more or less. All right, I don't really know. I didn't go out and try to measure. I said, Is that the standard today? If it was being built today? He said, Of course not. I said, What would the standard be? He says, Well, of course it depends, but 26 would be ideal. 20 feet wide. Oh, and there are no curves on this road. 20 feet, so there's no margin for error. Um, it's one of the most dangerous intersections in town, not by the data presented, but I provided you with the police printout um, covering a period of time. And I asked you to look at the number of violations, motor vehicle enforcement activity um, that has taken place in that immediate vicinity. Um, I highlighted in yellow uh, the incidents which appear to be uh, related, and um, it's dark there at night. It's dark, no curves, 20 foot road. Oh, by the way, um, section 701.3c of your regulation says in order for you to grant a permit, you must find that the proposed use shall have easy accessibility, not just accessibility, easy accessibility for fire apparatus and police protection. I was a uh, firefighter for 40 years, drove fire engines. Um, I found driveways that were 20 feet wide to be challenging. Uh, never mind the roadway. Um, in my non-expert opinion, I think you have some significant issues with turning radius both in and out of the property, uh, the cemetery road, and some turning radiuses within uh, the project presented as well. Can they be adjusted? Maybe. Um, but as presented, no. 701.4 of your regulations, in order for you to grant a permit, you must find the water supply and stormwater drainage systems conform with accepted engineering criteria and comply with all the standards of the applicable regulatory authority. There are no fire hydrants anywhere near this property no fire hydrants. So the only sources of water would be whatever the fire apparatus carries. Maybe it's 500 gallons, maybe it's 750. It may be a truck with a thousand. I'm not sure what the capacity is. Um, there is no way that there's adequate water supply for fire protection. Particularly, as we just heard, if there are sprinklers required, um, well water is all that's proposed. There's one little well house by Cemetery Road, and that's to supply the entire property. Can you imagine if that well house and that well, that pump goes down 
and there's a problem here, a fire, an accident, no water. Yes, I was told that there's a small pond up the road, um, drafting water out of a pond uh, is, is difficult at best, and pumping it down the long road uh, is more than difficult. Clearly, there's inadequate water supply. And again, you're required to find that there's an appropriate stormwater drainage system that conforms with accepted engineering criteria. Well, I just showed you it's, it's not a matter of opinion, but the criteria that was relied upon and presented in connection with this did not, does not take into account the many acres across the street that all flow right there. There's a storm drain going across in and into the existing uh, underground piping. Um, in fact, and you'll see some photos in the package, you'll see this area right here. It was a week, no, two weeks ago, I believe, after a rainstorm. You'll see the water uh, sitting there pooling. Why? Because the uh, storm drain wasn't working correctly. Um, obviously, plugged up. Um, you'll, you'll hear from one of the neighbors that um, uh, the applicant's agent uh, was out there trying to blow the line clear, and there was some kind of verbal altercation about that issue, um, but it's clearly not functioning well, okay? Nor is it included in the plans. Um, so we have a problem here. Oh, well, and that well I told you about, it's about 415, 420 feet from the, uh, the barn. So, I provide you with the drainage report that you can see doesn't include uh, the water across the street. 701.5 for a special permit says you must make a finding in order to grant the permit that the proposed plans provide for the protection of the environment of the area. I didn't hear any any argument, any facts, anything in that regard. Uh, but I do know, as it was even said, that the proposed plan, assuming it could happen, would drain all the waters from this site into the Scantic River. That's assuming, of course, that an easement was granted, which it hasn't and won't. Section 701.6E, compatible design. In order for you to grant the permit, you must make a finding that it's appropriate with the overall character of the community as outlined in the plan of conservation and development. I don't think any of us would argue with the characterization that this is a rural, quiet setting. No nighttime activities. You know the area. I don't have to get into more. Section 701.8 says that you must make a specific finding that any use or proposed activities located directly adjacent to a residential zone will not impair values considering the location and size of the proposed use the nature and intensity involved conducted with the proposed use. My client's home was built in the mid-1800s. Um, yes, technically she's an a business home, but the house has been there since the mid-1800s. It's not like she decided to build a house in a commercial zone. It's a de facto residential zone. I mean, we just can't deny that. It is what it is. And again, I asked you if you were in the same position, uh, how would you view it? Your regulations, uh, section 701.9, require a track impact study. Uh, you recall last time uh, the applicant attempted to seek a permit without 
a required traffic impact study uh, required. Attempted to uh, obtain a permit without a weapons application and permit. Uh, to their credit, they came back with a traffic impact study. The regulation says the primary objective is to assess transportation impacts of new development should identify needs for any improvements to the roadway system to provide satisfactory level of service and to address safety issues. A 20 foot road with no proposal to upgrade that. I asked you whether or not you think that meets the criteria. Your 701.9.2 requirements says that a traffic study will be required for any development that generates more than 50 new parking spaces. So now we at least have a study, uh, and that's somewhat helpful. Uh, we're talking a lot more than 50. Uh, there are been questions raised um, as to whether or not uh, the numbers utilized uh, are in fact realistic. The study has to include at least existing conditions, current volumes, which it does, existing and proposed sight lines. Well, you, you've been told uh, that's the finding. Um, Bud Abbott uh, will speak. Um, he went out today with his son yesterday, I'm sorry, went out with his son and took photographs, which you have in front of you. Um, one looking to the east, one looking to the west. Um, and of course, there are no trees at this time of year. There's no foliage. Um, so you have the best opportunity to view that you're ever going to have. And I think you can see quite clearly that uh, notwithstanding the claims in the study that you can see 450 or more feet, um, I didn't see it. You don't see it in the photos. And but we'll address that. The data, by the way, as I think you noted, um, is old data. It's nearly four years old. That's not, yeah, it's old. That's all there is. That's all there is. But to ask us to accept it as gospel uh, four years later uh, is asking a lot. Uh, the photographs of the sight lines I've included, I've included the police blotter, if you will. Um, alcohol sales. Page 40 of your regulations is section 805. Alcohol sales only by special permit, subject to the following. All live or amplified entertainment music must be approved for the site to ensure that noise pollution is avoided. We heard the description from the architect that the entire east facing wall basically will be sliding glass doors the nice weather will be open. What do you think? Do you think it's going to not disturb the neighbors? I mean, there may be insulation in the building, but when one entire wall is essentially opened up, um, you can't control that. It's not realistic. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful idea, and in another location, it might be just terrific, um, but not in this location, not next to the homes. I provided you with your section 805. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have to ask, so what's the end game here? The plans show at least three or four places where, and it's designated. Here in yellow, cap for future extension, extend water service, cap for future extension, um, they said they want to and need to expand, and, and we're not suggesting tonight that they can't or shouldn't, but, you know, to 
deal with this on a piecemeal basis, even though we know there's going to be more that are capping for future development, um, you got to wonder. They say they need to do this to uh, generate additional revenue to support their, their good programs and whatnot. And that's understandable. Um, look, I don't have the specs, um, but I think some of you know, um, I've got a little experience, but we're probably looking at a project that could run two million, two and a half million. It could be more, it could be a little less, depends how much they want to put into it. It's a lot of money, a lot of money for a part-time event venue. Um, I don't know any true businessman um, who would say that makes business sense. Take $2 million, put it in the bank, get 5%, and without touching the principal, you have $100,000. I think that'll be a heck of a shot in the arm for the society. Again, I'm not telling them what to do with their money. If they've got a benefactor, apparently hoped in this building as well, God bless them, okay? But you can't say that without building this project, at the cost of several million dollars is the only way this, this society is going to survive. That's just not being honest. So where does it end? How many other cherished spots in town will suffer the same fate? If you got 10 acres, 20 acres, 30 acres, can you just do it? Maybe, maybe, I mean, you know. You have places here in town where such activities can be properly conducted. And notwithstanding an earlier speaker's comments about these other venues, um, for the most part, maybe in all cases, they're in commercial zones. Okay, and they've always been commercial zones, and I mean true commercial zones. I mean Route 5. I mean, is there anything more commercial than that? So Let's not try to compare Route 5 venues with this beautiful piece of property. Um, it's apples and oranges, <laughs> not even close. So um, that kind of wraps up, and I'm sure you're delighted here to say this on my presentation. Um, Mr. Uh, Abbott, Mr. Devin, the two immediate neighbors, uh, wish to be heard and I noticed that there's a sign up here. Let's see it all. Um, I'd ask that you allow them to be here. They will give you a little more information, most importantly, about the water situation. And uh, Mr. Devin can actually address that as well. Mr. Abbott. Neil uh, murdered my name about 50 times. My name is Abbott Schultz, my name's Cemetery Road. My wife and I and my daughter and my son all live there. And we've been there uh, for two and a half years. Wonderful, wonderful place. We love East, uh, East Windsor. It's a wonderful spot. And I may be the only lifetime member of the Historical Society. When I first moved in, I thought it was so wonderful. I joined for lifetime, which is going to be a member forever of the family. So uh, I am certainly. Pro historical society. Not against it. I think it's a wonderful thing. All the things they're doing. I think it's really interesting that of all these people in the room, we can only get two instead of against or the uh, or for the, the uh, proposal. Uh, I've been here, uh, like we said, two and a half years. Uh, 
the, the plan here is it's very broad. If you look at the water there at my property, uh, I spent $15,000 repairing the driveway and bring a 48 inch pipe under the driveway to take care of the water that goes through there. That was before they're making all these changes and all this asphalt for that. My wife, when she leaves, and see where the pond is that they go to the right, they left a little spur of the driveway, which was asked very nicely uh, by the source that I'm doing right when And I said, yeah, she only goes out the right way because it's such a tough turn to do. When you get to the street, you're, your life is in your hands there. We said, if you look to your left, and we did this yesterday with my son in You back your car up 10 feet, look to your left, pictures. You can't see anything all the way past the cemetery because of the road of trees. So, unless they're going to come in from every tree down, all the way down from two, three, four hundred feet, you're going to have that problem forever. When you look to the right, you can see all the way up to the church. It's only one tree. They, they own the tree on the side of the tree down. But it's not the same on the left. And that's where the cars go faster because they have a good straight run. And believe me, they come up here pretty fast sometimes. And there's many, many people that ride bikes, kids, kids on bikes. People are crazy that they do ride a bike there sometimes, but they do. So it, it's a little dangerous there. So that's my one thing. Uh, and I, I, I feel very bad to up here at the moment um, because I really am a supporter of this broken play. Uh, I think it's a great thing. They've got five or six wonderful buildings there that could be using. I happen to know, speaking to the president of the association, that, that when the Larry Triple looked at that the first time the blue barn, he said, tear it down. That's a quote. Anybody want to sue me? Sue me. He told me that person. So he said, tear it down, because the view from the barn next to the red barn is much better. So why they want to use this barn, pursue it so well, you know, and spent all this money on this for everybody in the room here is against this, except for three people. So, uh, but that's about all I have. Let me just see if I have more notes here. I think that's about it. I'm trying to keep it short as possible. Uh, and the last thing is if there really is another plan here for the future. Would it be wrong for uh, somebody to spend some money and propose the whole thing to all 200 acres down below to the river all, and show what its real grand plans would look like? Maybe everybody will want it. But this right here is not a good thing. And I'm certainly not going to give my permission to let the water go through the land. So, unless somebody can override it, a good lawyer, uh, that's going to be a problem anyway. So, thank you very much. Uh, who's next? Yeah. I don't know Richard Peter, one twenty one Stanford Road. I'm going to that uh, pipe close to my property. I had a problem with John telling me that he had rights to go up the road. Now I called my attorney and he tells me there's no pipe on my property when it purchased the home. So they're telling me there is a pipe. So he was over there with a company trying to blow the line out. Because it was flooded across the street. So my wife went over there to talk to him, and he said he was doing it so we wouldn't have a flooded cellar, which I might have been doing my property for flooding. So I called him and I said, What are you doing, John? He said, I'm just trying to point a pipe out to be some grass. I said, You can't be doing it. How are you doing I don't know. So, yeah, so, Sorry, we muted it. Please continue. So he said, call your attorney. So I did. I called my attorney. He told me, he looked at my deed and everything, no pipe, nothing under my ground. He said, if there is, he says, you have a right to cap it. I said, I'm not like that. I can't do that with every guy. But then it creates a lot of problems. So why, you know, why get ugly? It's not worth it. So, and I'm right in the, this, this thing that they're doing is right in my backyard. I'm a lot closer than Gail is to it. And it's right there. Everybody thought I own the blue barn. 
I said, I wish I did it, but that's all I have to say. I have something written, so I can stay on track with what I wanted to share. And I will be giving you. Excuse me one second. Sir, you didn't sign the, the sheet. Could you please sign your name on the sheet? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I did sign. So I'm good. Okay. okay. Can, you, can you please sign? Um, so I'll be handing this out after. Can you please state your name for the record? Yeah, that's in my. Sorry. So my name is Gail Guadagher. My husband, Lester, and I have lived at 117 Standard Grove since 1976. We raised five children in East Windsor. Our house is at what I call the epicenter of this proposal. The aluminum blue building I refer to is 80 feet from our property line and a total of roughly 100 feet from our back patio. To say we are opposed for granting the special use permit would be an understatement. First, I will be sharing a petition of opposition that has been signed by 175 East Windsor residents. And I can tell you that if I didn't work and my neighbor Rich didn't work, we could probably have gotten five times this. We just didn't have the time. These people all feel as we do. Stantic is a beautiful residential slash agricultural neighborhood. And this type of activity does not belong here. Commercial activity belongs in a commercial zone such as Route 5 or 140. We absolutely do not need any more traffic on the roads. And we don't want to bring large groups of people that are strangers who often may be drinking at an event around our homes. This would create a dangerous precedent as there are lots of agricultural plots of land in East Windsor that are intertwined with residential areas. So anyone can come along, could buy a, a acreage of land and say, oh, now I want to turn it into using a special use permit, turning into that for this. Second are some points more specific to us. We spent years restoring our antique house and maintaining our yard and gardens, the value of which would be impacted. We have seven young grandchildren, ages four and under, who just this year visited our home for several outdoor family birthday parties we hosted for them. Who would want to come to an outdoor picnic knowing that potentially 250 strangers, along with all the noise they could bring, may be on the other side of the fence? We often sit out at night on our back patio in the evening, stargazing and enjoying the sound of the bullfrogs from our little toy hunt. So we don't have central air. So there are many summer nights where we sleep with the bedroom windows open. If there was a large party or gathering, I guess that would end our ability to enjoy the peace and quiet of our patio or open our windows. Our entire way of life would be impacted and basically destroyed if you approve this proposal. I cannot tell you the nights of sleep I have lost over the fear that everything I have worked for all of my life and our ability to enjoy our home and yard would be absolutely destroyed. I am pleading with you to please do not approve the special use permit which includes the serving of sale and or alcohol. And thank you very much for your time and consideration. And I know I'm not supposed to address the public, but I do appreciate it for coming out and support. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Just come forward. My name is Cheryl Foster. I was uh, I live at 95 Scandal. So 
I was born and raised in East Windsor, where my depot street. I've been on Scanic Road for 12 years now. Um, there was that one point where the house I originally bought, I had to tear down because it wasn't structurally sound. So when I was trying to decide what to do, um, I talked to the my builder and he says, do you like where you I said, I love it. And the horses and agriculture. Matter of fact, that blue barn, I brought one of my horses over here to train. Bringing this into, you know, I really feel bad for you guys. You know, that barn is a hundred feet away from their house. How can they have a backyard? And what's the precedence that are set? You know, the German Club, all those other places, people who bought the property around that, they were already functions. They were already a place that had functions. This was a place when I moved bought my place, we had the horses in there. There was training, there was boarding. Um, so this is gonna change that. The other thing I wanted to say was, um, you know, what kind of precedence we're saying that everybody just brought up? We've got a lot of historical houses in there. What's to say someone doesn't buy that and turn those into P and Bs or things for wedding parties? So I just really would like you guys to consider you know what they're Anyone else? Is there anyone online who would like to uh, voice an opinion? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Christina Dahl, one to Reservoir Road. I don't live in the area, but I am concerned for the neighborhood um, as a historic district um, and also for the neighbors that will be surrounding this um, event center. Um, I think it's important for someone that doesn't live in the area to have their perspective um, because, as stated, that this could happen in their area. Anybody else that has agricultural land or even a piece of property that is not agricultural, but suddenly wants to make it agricultural, this type of facility could go in. Um, there is an article in the JI of uh, January 21st of 2020, uh, stated that the Historical Society wanted to turn the site into a cultural center with a goal to make the site for large activities done by the town. This was performances, musicals, antique shows, farmers markets, and weddings. A list was compiled of what was needed to develop um, the site, which included new walkways, moving items into the building, setting up external speakers, planting trees, installing lighting, Wi-Fi, and new signs. They stated the sky is the limit. In addition to this article, the discussion at the March um, meeting, which was informal, um, and on the application, it had listed activities such as 4-H meetings, future farming with our American meetings, maple sugar and demonstration, agricultural products, horse shows, ice cream social, rotary club, lions club, Easter egg hunt, art show, museum, uh, adult educational show classes, blood drive, health fair, graduation, showers, weddings, wine beer tasting, flea market, craft show, emergency preparedness center, youth, Baseball, soccer, basketball, line dancing, square dancing, golf lessons, yoga, class, hiking, cross country skiing, and surgery. Yeah, these are all the things that they talked about. So we don't know what the center actually is going to be doing or what type of events are going to be there. Um, it's the list is broad and it's very concerning to me and then the, and the neighbors. And uh, what they really truly want it for. If they actually would come forward and um, guess I'll have to say Attorney Needleman, um, 
proposed that we could see the entire plan, it would be helpful for all of us to understand what they really want from this event center. Um, and with this no clear direction, how can one say that it's harmony with the neighborhood? Because each and every event is different. So we can't judge it. And if we look at each and every event, not every event here is going to be in harmony with the neighborhood. Um, I also, um, I, I don't know which uh, commission member it was, but it did actually make comments in regards to um, whether or not the events would be for agricultural use. And I did find many of the things that were listed that above are not agricultural supported. Therefore, um, I'm having a difficult time actually supporting um, this event center. I also know that the proposed facility is in the it's not technically or nationally recognized as a historic site, but it is recognized under plan conservation development as well, in which we should actually take significance in the historic area and be aware of this, not take away from the character of the neighborhood. I'm concerned that that taking this barn that was used for animals, which was basically an accessory building, and turning it into a bed set. If this is going to really take this, going to really change the character of the neighborhood. Um, there's a couple other things that I question is if um, the footage, I mean, if, if this is turned to an event center, um, I question if ADP is really, really compliant to the houses that are budgeted. Um, I also want to question the parking spaces when I printed out um, some handouts for you for the ice cream social. I don't have a Put the chair. Let me make sure we can once it goes to the back. Okay. So these are pictures from their ice cream social. They, um, they, they had posted the links when they're public, so it wasn't like I stole them from anyone. Um, but on the first picture, it shows 127 cars parked across the street. I may, you know, miss a few here and there, but I did my best my comment. Um, the next page shows seven additional cars, and there's actually one parked in the little triangle. Not sure how it got there, but why someone's not having a good idea. But it does show that you know the, the concern about where people are parking on the fence. And then the next picture, I have 24 more cars parked right over by the event center. I'm assuming this must have been the vendors because whenever you do an event and you have vendors, you have to accommodate for how many people will have cars for the vendors. So if you have 20, excuse me, 24 vendors, 24 cars, 50 vendors, 50 cars. Um, you see where I go with this. <laughs> so I counted 158 cars. And their proposed site only proposes for 87 parking. So where are the rest of the cars being parked? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, if they say that it's not going to be that big, or what events are they actually having? Um, it, it makes a difference. So this is this is the social that they just did last year, and already we don't have enough parking spaces. So where are those cars going to park? But in the neighborhood. Um, the, the next picture I thought was interesting because they had wagon rides, which is I think is just a fantastic idea. You know, I love it. I would I would go on that. Um, but I also see the FedEx trucks behind it. And, <laughs> and this might be like the best intersection. But I'm a little nervous about the safety of, of events like that. Um, and, and this, you know, things like this aren't in the traffic report. So when you say, hey, it's not going to happen, here's a picture of something. Yes, it can happen. Um, it really can happen. Uh, the next picture is uh, shows someone walking across the street, car pulling out, a car with his brake lights on. So I see this as a 
potential traffic issue. And there's a police car there, and this is no disrespect to the police department at all, but I don't see an officer out actually directing any traffic or, or having any concern over what is going on. So once again, I, I think about you know the issues that the neighbors are gonna have to have when there's big events going on. Um, the last picture I provided says, I think it's really hard to look at a plan and see how close that blue bar is in relation to the neighbor. And, and I apologize everybody here because you can't see the picture, but if you can actually put that in with a public document, Ruth, that'd be great if anyone wants to go up. But it does really show that the neighbor's backyard, yes, the bar is in their backyard. And it is going to really impact their way of life. So those are a few things that I wanted to um, say in support of Gail and um, and our neighbors, and I do feel that this special needs permit should not be approved. Um, and I also uh, just hope that the uh, mission really thinks a lot about this because it's going to change a lot of people's lives in that area. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, Hello, my name is Julia Pratt. I live at 35 Cemetery Road, just Sunday. Um, I'm right down the road from here, and um, I have a lot of concerns about the traffic and about trash. Uh, we have people speeding down Cemetery Road like all the time. They come up from um, Amelia, they turn the corner, they just kind of zip up the street. There's also a lot of alcohol bottles and beer bottles and beer cans that are always thrown. Tossed in my hand for some reason. I'm always out there picking things up. So there's a lot of drinking beer going around without that kind of event space. Um, and I think an oversaturation of event spaces in this town. What happens when this place doesn't meet the revenue it wants to generate? What happens? Do they sell it? Does someone else come in? Does it turn into uh, a brewery? Does it turn into a strip club? I mean, what does it turn into? What kind of, like, where's, where's it stop? It's not funny. It's like people live there. I mean, especially the people who have left the place, they have to look out their window and see whatever's going on. Someone decides they're going to pee behind the fence because they're drunk and they don't want to wait for that. And then we have these people who live here, the ones that are my neighbors, they have to potentially have that in their backyard. And giggles aside, somebody has a very nice property with a nice camp in the woods. They can put it there. That's always an idea. Um, also, dumpsters. Do you have like a plan for the trash that's going to be generated there? Do you have big dump trucks coming in and out? Dumpsters, uh, whatever. Cigarette butts being thrown around. You know, who's going to clean the property? Are right. the people who are for it are the ones going to be reaping the benefits of the monetary? I mean, this place generates a lot of money into that. Uh, it doesn't have alcohol, which has a lot of events here, and people. Have a good time here. I don't know why the town, and that's the question I have. If this is a scout hall that was put together by uh, people donating money and benefactors or whatever, why does the town, um, does the town own the building and the property? Were they gifted to it? Is it a pay for play? I'll just switch to the venue for that. I mean, we're like, why? That's a call I don't know. And if alcohol isn't served here, why would it serve there? So I think that's all I have to ask. I have a lot of questions. Oh, if I have more questions, could we present them in writing to you and send them to you so we don't have to talk at the next meeting? I know the lawyer isn't here for the application. Yes, yeah, yes, you can okay. always submit. So, yeah, yeah. I have some more things for comments, but I just don't want to go too much. Thank sure. you for your comments as well and your questions because I appreciate that. I have a lot of work for this time. I don't want to have time for this. It's a lot to digest. So, I just want to thank everybody.
Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Denise Menard, uh, 73 Miller Road in Brightwood. I didn't come here expecting to speak at all. And um, I, my, my comments will be brief because it's already been late. Um, I want to correct an assumption that the people that are, did not speak, or three people that did not speak for the project, I think was three, all are against the project. I came and I, I know a number of people out here that came to listen to get educated in what the whole thing was. I've seen the no signs. I don't know. I understand people that are close to the property certainly have much different invested interests than I do. I have been to a number of events here. They're very well run. I've also been to all the ice cream social that they've had at the historical society and, and a number of other events, and they're always run well. If I were the people that live as closely to the property, I don't I don't know how I would feel. Um, certainly the people right there by the barn, I I would have a hard time with that. But knowing the people that are running this, um, they're they're good solid people that do quality things. Um, I know you have a, a lot of unanswered questions and I'm sure there's gonna be more. So um, I'll be watching, but I don't have an answer right now. So please don't expect that because I'm here that I am a no vote because I didn't say at the beginning that I was for it. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Burnett, and I'm at Nine Cemetery Road. Uh, one of the concerns that I have. And I'm also a member of the historical society. I try to attend every meeting that they have. We also joined the River Commission. And since we've moved to East Windsor, we definitely are very invested in upkeep and trying to be good stewards and good citizens. Um, something that I've noticed is there's supposed to be four meetings each year for the historical society. And at those times, some of these things were supposed to be discussed. Uh, there were not actually four meetings. Also, when questions have been put towards the board of the historical society, information is not given back, nor are uh, responses given back through email or phone. So I think that transparency is a very important thing. I noticed that a lot of plans that were put forward at the beginning that we did look at are not the same plans that are being put forward now. And they were never discussed with any of the members in the historical society. So that is what I have to say. Also, the last thing, when you take a look at all that black surface area and we're talking about conserving the property, that's pavement. That's not being good stewards of the land and trying to maintain and conserve that land. So who wants to put up a, a parking on it? Thank you. Sorry, I was a little nervous. Yes, sir. Can I stand up to ask you a question? 
I'm sorry. Do I have to stand up and sign and just ask you a question? Yes, please. I'm yes, sir. All the work they've done. I'm sorry. Another person is asked to be recognized. <clears throat> I have Phil Bone, 22 Scandic Road, uh, 49 years. When we were looking at that house, we almost didn't buy it because of the sun state highway or state road. And pleased to say that the traffic is minimal and it's a very quiet area. I'm also pleased to say that I've been to several events at the um, society, historic society, and by the way, thanks to you for your comments that are awesome. Most people don't come to me like this praise that private they come to express their feelings, and they have like an attorney to do that for them. I read the traffic report, and I believe it ended with a sentence or two that said there's nothing in this report. To prevent this project from moving forward. I don't know the exact words. We have regulate, by the way, I've shared planning and zoning for 10 or 15 years. We have regulations. It's apparent to me that this project is within the regulations. It might be a building, it might be one kind of flowering, a plant. These are things that you address in a special project. And I heard I only heard one or two things tonight that required some clarification. I was sitting up there. So um, you got to put the feelings aside, of course, because everybody comes up and goes her, not in my backyard. And it's almost in my backyard. But uh, I think it's what they've done there has been good for the town. I think what they plan will be good for the town. I always pictured the, when I was on family zoning, the lot across the street would be like a little village connected to um, the, um, the horse, like the state of um, to attract uh, tourists. You want to make the town grow, you want to be a thriving community, you don't want to be a show. At least I don't. Um, so that's my comments. Thank you. By the way, um, I believe the police chief has ordered you uh, no comments on the um, traffic study. Have you received that? And we stated earlier their meeting is tomorrow. Yes, but I believe he's already forwarded coming. No? Nothing that I have seen. All right, well, then it's coming. Okay. Did, sir, did you sign the? Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay, my name is Paul Anderson, 89 Main Street, Broadbrook. Uh, I'm a member of the Historical Society and also president of the Scout Hall Building Committee. And the comparison of this building to the Historical Society has been brought up more than once. 
I want to get something on the record. The town owns this building, all the surrounding property, period. The history behind it is not that significant. The Scout Hall Building Committee has a lease. So we lease this property from the town. The reason there's no alcohol allowed here is because it is town property. No alcohol is allowed on town property. So that's that circumstance. There's no direct comparison whatsoever. We operate this facility under our mission statement, which is to provide a place for youth groups to be able to meet no charge. And that's what we do. So comparing this property with that property is inappropriate. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, one other attempt at uh, online. Is there anyone online that would like to uh, present a comment? Okay. Well, it's pretty obvious with everything that's been brought up this evening that we are not at a position to close this hearing. Jay, I'll give you one last opportunity if you'd like to say anything else. Again, for the record, Jay, you're Street, Jay, you're so uh, I, I don't have anything additional to add at this time. I think you know, I would agree with, with the chair and I'm guessing Mr. Neal would agree that we've all heard a lot of information here tonight. Uh, there's a lot to digest and uh, continuing the hearing would be my request so that we have some time to get together with our client and look at the comments that we heard tonight from the board from the public and, and get back to you at the next, next meeting with some, some answers for some of those questions. Okay, so our next meeting is on December 27th. So I will entertain a motion to continue the public hearing till our next meeting. I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing on application PZ 2022-26 for 115 Stanford Road. It's a special use permit for event hosting. The applicant is East Windsor Historical Society, and we will continue to our next meeting, which is December 27th at 6 30 p.m. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would respectfully request that if the board desires to leave the hearing open, and I'm not advocating that that happen, but that's certainly within your, your discretion to do so. But uh, we, we feel sufficient information has been provided to the board to make a decision. Um, as it stands now, uh, I have nothing further to offer, but my point is if the commission needs it appropriate to continue the matter, um, I'm not available and I know a lot of other people uh, Christmas week are not available. I'm not sure what your plans are, um, but a lot of the public were not going to be asked to come out for a third time. Um, I would ask you not to put them in the position to try and make a decision. Do they come to a third meeting or do they uh, enjoy that week that additional people take off? Um, not looking for a lengthy uh, uh, date. It could be the first meeting date in January would be fine. Respectfully request in light of the calendar um, that you consider. The law indicates you have 65 days after the close of the public hearings. Got that. Well, I, I understand. What I'm thinking is I, it may be up to the applicant as to if they wish to have it at the next meeting or continue it for the following meeting. Uh, um, 
it's, 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 their, it's their application. Uh, you know, it, 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 it is, is application, it, but you you said it's true. true, but us to prolong things. Uh, and and use up that sixty five day window is is not giving them their due process. So well, no, we wouldn't be using up the sixty five days. The sixty five days starts at the close of the hearing. So if the hearing is left open. It doesn't matter whether it's continued to next week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, so they're not prejudiced in that respect. Thirty five days to close the hearing. We have thirty five days to close the hearing. Exactly. So. And then 65 days for a decision. So, so we're taking 14 days away from the applicant in the, in the time to close the public hearing. No, I, I don't think so. What, what I'm requesting is that the continuance date. The, the following meeting would then be January 10th. Right. And that's within the 35 day window that the but if, if we are not at a point to be able to close the hearing at that point, we're, we're, we're taking time away from the applicant. Mm -hmm to be able to address if we have more questions or more concerns. Theoretically, I suppose you're right, Mr. Chairman. Again, there will have been three public hearings at that point. Um, Our, we will have as many as it takes to get all the questions. Absolutely. Um, I just, it's hard to foresee the need, but one never knows. What we will do is I'd say we will put it on the next schedule and it will be up to the applicant if they wish to present at that time or not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dave. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous, Peg, uh, continue to our next public hearing, or next meeting. Okay, remainder of our agenda. Questions I can't make it. Like she said, can we email some questions? With the meeting still going on, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Now. That's all right. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I get too many pieces of paper out. Okay. 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 Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. We're going we're to take a five recess. minute recess. Just let the room clear. Yeah, I've been the room clear. Come on, you can't get them out of here.